the film which you are about to see is an account of the making of a cult classic. A group of young filmmakers, technicians, and actors produced a film in Austin in 1973, which would depict the mad and the macabre as it had never been seen before in a motion picture. For them, the low-budget production, in the sweltering heat of the Texas summer, would prove a difficult experience, and the worldwide success of the picture would be soured by dishonesty and corruption. But the events of that summer shoot would change the face of the horror film and lead to the production of one of the most bizarre films in the annals of American cinema history, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Shooting Texas Chainsaw Massacre was like a really grueling, fun, but very chaotic experience of filmmaking. When I got through, I didn't care if I never worked on another picture. People were puking, you know, on that set continuously. Cuts and thorns and weeds and dirt and rocks and bugs and, and getting hurt. To this day, I've never met anybody who's blasé about the film. They either love it, or they hate it, or they've loved it, or they've hated it for years. Everything is incited to attack the audience. And that is something that we don't find in horror anymore. Everybody, like, wants to shake your hand or meet you halfway and then, like, try and scare you by hiding behind a door. No, this thing was coming out in fucking clown paint, blood spattered with homicide on its brain. shot was just, that's just pure ridiculous accident. The original script called for there to be a run over dog in the road. It was shot, a shot of this run over dead dog and come up to the van going by. The script started with, uh, you know, a shot of the sun and then the sun was to dissolve into uh, the, uh, into the glazed portion of a dead dog's eye and the camera starts moving back out of that. Then you see the van pull up in the background. But they got out to shoot that, and God had given them the most wonderful gift in the world. There was this dead horse by the side of the road. This never happens. You never see a dead horse lying by the side of the road. This was the perfect thing. This giant dead horse covered with flies, the perfect thing to shoot and pull up to this thing. But they didn't want to shoot that because their delicate sensibilities meant that they'd have to get close enough to shoot it and it would just stink. I uh, was out driving around the countryside and saw a freshly killed armadillo that had just been hit by a car, so I took it home and got a book about how to do taxidermy and I taxidermied this armadillo just for the hell of it. So that ended up being the dead thing in the road and not the dead dog. You know, I mean, d domestic creatures, domesticated creatures, and uh, it was just too, too horrible. You've got an armadillo, we'll just put it down on the ground, run over it, you know, and splatter its guts everywhere, and I said, no, you won't. I don't recall ever having the idea of running over his armadillo. <laughs> I respected that armadillo. And they said, okay, we won't destroy it. And Bob, I had no intention of messing up your armadillos. Help me God. To me, it's a completely ridiculous thing, but then people have, have, have gone into just great pains of glory about this wonderful, spectacularly grand, brilliant opening. <laughs> I love movies. The summer of love was over. The 60s ended with Charles Manson and his family bringing a new, dark perspective to the ideal of free hippie life. The Vietnam War continued to rage on under the Nixon government. Advances in technology had allowed man to walk on the moon. American cinema was also changing in the wake of Easy Rider, as young, radical filmmakers started to replace the Hollywood old school, and the horror genre was no exception. In 1968, 
George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead brought horror home in graphic detail. Gone were the creatures from outer space and monsters from Eastern European folklore. Night of the Living Dead was not set in some distant past in some far off land. The threat? Flesh-eating human beings attacking the modern American home. The violence lingering and visceral. The climax inconclusive. Stubbornly refusing to provide the audience with a satisfactory resolution to help them sleep at night. Night of the Living Dead was an enormous success on the drive-in and midnight movie circuits and set a precedent for the genre from which there was no turning back. The emphasis now was on the contemporary attack on the American dream. Young, vital filmmakers were eager to depict their visions of a dysfunctional America, and horror was the perfect milieu for that metaphor. Drive-in screens across the U.S. were flooded with this new wave in low-budget horror cinema. In 1972, a collaboration between Sean S. Cunningham, who would go on to direct the popular slasher prototype Friday the 13th, and Wes Craven of Nightmare on Elm Street and Scream fame, would bring horror inside the harmony and safety of the middle American home with The Last House on the Left. In this case, the violence was arguably as hardcore as had ever been depicted in cinema. In Last House, there are no living dead cannibals just a gang of criminals hell-bent on a rampage of rape, murder, and dismemberment, the elimination of the supernatural from the horror film. Interestingly, the final showdown that features death by Chainsaw. At this time, a young graduate from the film program at the University of Texas in Austin, called Toby Hooper, was making his first independent feature, Eggshells. Hooper was already considered an up-and-coming talent among Austin filmmakers, having directed two PBS-funded documentaries. Eggshells would win an award at the Atlanta Film Festival, but received only limited distribution. Hooper wanted to get to Hollywood, and knew that he could not do this by making art films with limited audience appeal. He and Eggshells co-writer Kim Henkel decided it was necessary to write a picture in an established genre. None of the titles that we used prior to release were intended to be anything other than working titles almost in jest, what one time we called it head cheese. The original title w was uh, Stalking Leatherface. I mean, what do you do with that? It was called Leatherface when it was filmed and um, a couple of other things, but Leatherface, I think, was the last title that they had on it until Scarron came up with the, the name The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I went to a friend of mine and I, I, I threw the title out. I would never see that. I will not, my girlfriend won't see it. I will not see this nothing by that name. And I said, no, that's, that's it. That's the title. And with a title like Texas and Chainsaw and Massacre, heck, I'd go see it. You know, but the Texas Chainsaw, because, I mean, people think of Texas. I thought of Texas the same way. It's a different country. The significance of Texas, it's kind of that place where something like the Bloody Benders could have happened, you know? And, 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 and the isolation, and the rural. It's kind of like city boy, country boy thing. You know, we're, we're all afraid that out there in those kind of dark corners of rural America or wherever it may be, that there are these inbred types that are doing terrible and dastardly things. It's like I was always, you know, in, in Texas, always lived in the city, and, and and out there got kind of scary. And I think one of the appeals of the film is that it's not a supernatural film. You know, you watch this movie and you think there are people like this in the world. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre was inspired by the story of Ed Gein. In the small farm town of Plainfield, Wisconsin, young Ed grew up in the 30s with a domineering mother who instilled in the impressionable boy strict religious guidelines and the idea of all women as filthy, diseased harlots. Ed's mother passed away. Unable to cope with the loss, Ed sealed off her bedroom and kept the house exactly as it was when she was alive. In his loneliness, Ed began holding conversations with her and before long started paying visits to the local graveyard to dig up fresh graves and bring parts of the bodies home. He would eat the flesh, make furniture out of bones, and even dress up in the skin of the cadavers. And when I was like, three or four years old, 
and, and so when the Wisconsin relatives came to town, they always had this story, you know, because they could see that it wound me up and it started scaring the hell out of me. And so they would tell this story about the guy that makes the, uh, covered his furniture with skin, with human skin, human skin, lampshades. Oh my God. It was only a matter of time before Ed's dementia would lead to murder. Ed was arrested in 1958 when his second known victim was found hanging by the ankles in the barn behind his house, naked and gutted like a deer. It stuck with me. It was always, it was always ever present. You've heard the expression, you are what you eat. Yeah, well, Leatherface is what he wears, you know. He assumes the, the personality and the character of, of the, the mask he dons. He's the most powerful character in the film, physically. He is the most violent of the characters in the film. He's also the most frightened character in the film. He has somehow, uh, by the older brother, uh, probably assumed that role, that the, the feminine role, in the house. Even though he's extremely violent and dangerous, in fact, he's really defending himself. That's really what he does. He's a big baby. I mean, in fact, in, inside the movie, he freaks out because he doesn't know where in the hell are they coming from? Where are all these people coming from? The character came out of long discussions with Toby and Kim. And then my attempt to say, how do I create that personality without having a voice or a face? So what I did was I went to a a state school, which was a residential community, a campus community for retarded persons. And I, I just spent these two days on the campus walking around, watching the way people moved. After two days, I walked across campus and I, I felt that no one could tell whether I was, whether I was a, a patient there or just an interloper. The main thing that strikes me is you've got this farmhouse and you've got three generations living there and they're all guys. Aren't there any women? You know, and, and it's so funny because Cam said, well, uh, well, that's, that's, that's part of the mystery of it. So uh, <laughs> what did I want to achieve with the chainsaw family to scare the shit out of somebody? <laughs> now, grandma was not in the script. I just made grandma, you know, I said, at least they have a petrified grandmother sitting up there to show at one time there were women. Uh, Get-togethers, uh, reunions, uh, whatever, holidays. Uh, I, I've seen more dysfunction and more hell you know, riddle through families than, uh, uh, than I would like to have. I, you know, I wish I hadn't seen um, uh, that much weirdness and family behavior. So I kind of always wanted to do something, you know, that's about a, um, a, a dysfunctional family. What we did is, is to create two corporations. One was Vortex, which was the production company, and the other was MAB. Uh, which was the investor corporation. Basically, Toby and I formed it in a sense. I mean, we didn't do the legal work, obviously, but you know, we created as, as a company that uh, was really the production company. The production company, of course, controlled the production, and the, and the, uh, the investor corporation funded it. But the control was with the production, with the production corporation, with Vartex, as far as the film was concerned. And then they. Uh, the investors got their original investments back, and then after that, the, it was split 50-50. And I was with the Texas Film Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, we started, and um, so I knew what we, we were trying to bring films to Texas, and all of a sudden there was this film being made by a Texan instead of flying him in from New York or L.A. At that time in Austin, Toby was the only filmmaker who had actually done a feature film and so for us to have the opportunity to work with him we were all really uh, thrilled as young film students. He was telling me about this the next picture he wanted to do was a, a horror picture but unlike any, horror, unlike any horror picture you've ever seen Wayne. I heard about Toby Hooper this wacky guy who had made a movie called Eggshells was getting ready to make this horror movie and they were looking for you know young people to walk in and get their brains smashed in. I said, I can do that. Hello? He was going to school at the University of Texas, taking filmmaking as his major, and he was graduating this year. And he had, he had written this play called Leatherface, or this movie called Leatherface, 
and he was wanted to ride be interested or if I would take a part in it for him. Look what your brother did to that star! You know, they're making this movie in town, these fellow local guys. And it's a shame because um, you would have been perfect to play the killer, but they've already hired somebody to be the killer. A week later, I'm walking down the street and I run into him. I don't even remember him. And he stops me in the street and says, you know, they, um, this guy they hired, he's drunk. He's drunk in a motel and he won't come out. And they're desperate. Shooting began on July 15th, 1973 and would last for 32 days. shooting schedule was desperate. Oh, it was murderous, you know. It was hot as the middle of August. Seven days a week, 12 to 16 hours a day. It was an extremely difficult shoot in the sense that it was extremely hot. And we were extremely low budget. Everything's extreme on the shoot. At the time, I had just uh, gotten a 40 Conaline van because I wanted a, something to kind of carry my equipment around in. And we had high hopes of making a lot of movies in Austin. And Toby needed a van for the uh, kids to be traveling in. And so we made sort of a deal. I was sound man. My van was there every day, so you could rent my van. And so they used my van for the uh, production. Spend most every day in a sidewalk cafe drinking coffee. Inside a van on a road in Texas is not a pleasant place to be at almost any time. Uh, it's in the middle of August. It's hot. It was so hot that, I mean, you could only shoot for ma a matter of a few minutes. It was cramped because you got a sound guy, you got a, a fellow with a camera that's trying to get out of the way and trying to get the best shots. And it was fun to see Toby get cramped up and upside down and <laughs> every which way inside that van. I think we got along pretty good. We had our trying days, but I mean, we got along pretty well. The unit that's, that's, that's in the van, obviously, uh, our friends, and these were people that were brought together, and I'm not sure if any of them knew one another, so I had them spend a lot of time together. And even within the group in the van, it was funny because uh, Paul was like the outsider. Intentionally, I mean, in the van he was, but then also just as we hung out too, Paul was kind of like, you know, <laughs> ostracized, send him over there, you know. Yeah, unfortunately, Franklin was such a whiny bastard that I was, I was afraid if I ever took him off that I couldn't get him back. Uh, and so I kept him on. And so it was easy for everybody to go, God, I don't want to be near that son of a bitch. <laughs> and I, you can't blame him either. <laughs> he really was Franklin, because Paul Partain is really a nice guy. The guy I met named Franklin was easy to act with because you really didn't have to do much acting. Sally, what now? It was very easy to imagine that, OK, this is the kind of treatment that Franklin would get and the kind of treatment Franklin would deserve. Because, you know, he's just, just, <laughs> who wants to be around that shit all day? <laughs> Come on, Franklin. It's going to be a fun trip. Yes, it was real effective. We we're ready to kill each other. <laughs> There wasn't like a bad egg in the group, you know? Some, some shoots we've all worked on and there'll be one jerk or one, you know, one problem person, but except for Bob yelling at us all the time, don't touch that chair, get off of that stool. Well, to try to make it look like not an art director's play idea of, you know, what insane people would do, but trying to make it look like where they live. Not trying to get into their minds, mind you, but just sitting back and saying, okay, they have these parts left over from people and animals that they've killed, and, and what would they do with them? So what, what are the parts? They are bones and skins and hair and teeth. You know, if they are going to make things out of them, you know, what they would make out of them. I mean, it was really brilliant stuff. And as far as I know, the, the most of that stuff, he made it. He designed it, he made it. I'm sure with Toby's um, influence and direction. I mean, they were art pieces, to tell you the truth. You know, I described this human skeleton totem 
And then, then I described uh, to him several things like a jib that, uh, you know, that's made of, uh, say, railroad ties, so it looks substantial and homemade, you know, for the meat hooks. And so Bob would go instantly, and like overnight, he would, he would invent another, you know, an, another prop or another mask or another, uh, another piece of, uh, of dead art. Long time ago, the counties would, you know, if, if an animal died, the county would come and, you know, abattoir or something would come and, and, and pay you five bucks to take away the animal and render it for, you know, fertilizer. Then the county got to where, you know, they'd come around and pick them up for free, but then they got to where you had to pay them to come pick up the dead animals. And at that point, the farmers just said to heck with this, and so if a cow died or something, they'd haul it off in a distant corner of field and just let it go away. And uh, so we went up there and, you know, went around all these farms where there were cattle skeletons everywhere and gathered up a whole lot of them that way. He was having trouble finding some more exotic bones. At the time, I was working part-time for a veterinarian, so I had access to a huge bone yard. I know there were some monkey bones out there, and, and Bob just had a field day. He took his knapsack, and it was hilarious watching him just jumping over all these things, jumping for joy, and just loading up his knapsack like a complete insane person. <laughs> there was a, a lot of collecting of, of dead animal parts. We dragged all that stuff in there, and it, it, was, it was just a nice old country kitchen. It's an old house, a very nice house. And, uh, went in and, and, and decked it out. It was just like, just like the, the family should live there. And so already when you walk in and you saw all this, you felt uncomfortable, itchy. You didn't want to touch anything. At the time, I don't think we really appreciated it as much as I do now, especially since I am decorating sets. I just think it was um, it was another character in the movie and it would not have been the same movie without all of his work. I worked a long time doing experimentations of material to try to make something that might look like human skin that was peeled off and dried. And like the, the leather face faces, we took molds of people's faces and I came up with this uh, formula, if you will, of using uh, liquid latex and some fiberglass insulation material that I could peel off in very, very thin sheets and stick in there and so it layered up and and so it was fibrous looking and it was translucent and it and and it would naturally turn this kind of brownish, yellowish color. It would maintain a bit of the facial form. People we see and killed in the movies have been hit on the head with a uh, sledgehammer. So each of them is going to have a hole or, a, you know, has been abraded, bashed through right there. And so then, okay, what would they patch that up with? So we wired it up with, you know, thin wire. And it was all this very crude stuff and sewed on things, you know, to make it look like they had peeled somebody's face that they had killed. And then, you know, uh, had the face, they had the mouth kind of wired open with wire inside it and wired everything. You could see what they did. In cinema, at least at that time, you know, a death scene was portrayed as someone fires a gun and someone would fall over. At one time, I'd wanted to be either a doctor, a mad scientist, or a, a magician. And uh, so, yeah, I, I knew, I knew that it, it's, it's, it's not easy to kill somebody. Gunner, in my memory, was uh, this big teddy bear kind of a guy. Large guy, but sweet as sweet could be. And uh, I remember every, every time he hit me, one time he slipped and like he really hit me with the hammer and uh, was just like very upset about, you know, the fact that he had hurt me. <laughs> A blow to the skull with a heavy hammer would would send bone fragments first down into the brain, which would cause involuntary uh, spasms. Because also he was picking me up at the end and then throwing me over and then slamming the door. 
And I remember after every take, he would come, are you okay? Then you get the imagery of Slaughterhouse when Leatherface drags him up that little ramp, like, like you know, this is the little mock uh, Slaughterhouse, and he closes this leather door. You think you've seen the slaughter. I'm very, very pleased with the, you, you come out of this thing thinking you've seen a bloodbath and you've seen very little blood. And I take credit for a whole lot of that because when the girl gets hung on the meat hook, Toby told me originally that he wanted the meat hook to come out the front and blood spurt him. Uh, so if you do that, people are gonna try to figure out how you did the effect. I put in a lot of telephone calls to the MPAA asking their advice. You know, how do I get an R rating? No, actually, I said, how do I get a get a PG rating and um, and hang hang someone on a meat hook? And I talked them into you know it will be much much stronger with no blood at all, and that that scene has not one drop of blood in it. I knew how they were doing it at the time, and it still just scared the piss out of me, to tell you the truth. I had to come up with something that would fit under this very skimpy costume that had the strength to hold her up. I also had to design it with a woman's anatomy in mind because she was basically all the weight would be on her crotch. I had nothing to do with that. I washed my hands of all that completely. They, they were pissed off at me at the time, but I said, I'm not going to do something like this. Bob made for me, I talked about him, and he made for me like a little saddle, almost like a chastity belt looking thing of which I stacked tons of sanitary napkins in for padding for her. Then I came up with the idea to use nude stockings. I crisscrossed them across her body in the front and in the back. And then what was great, which I hadn't planned on, it worked really well, is there was just that little bit of a, a jerk. She won't talk about it and I won't talk about it. She was a great sport about it. And I think the longest we could hang her was about a minute. I had a two-year-old daughter at the time, and my, she would come out with my wife when, when she brought the food. And she would, she would just kind of play around the set and go into people's trailers. But on one particular day, the day when uh, the kids are hung on the meat hooks and leather faces cutting off the head of uh, the boyfriend, lunch came just at that moment as we started rolling camera. And my daughter came running in to say hello to everybody, just as Leatherface was coming down with, the, uh, with his chainsaw. And she screamed to high heaven and went running out of that house and down the road and was like trying to get away. No one had seen this kind of thing. People didn't know how to react. They didn't want the victims, they didn't want the actors to see me because they wanted, the, they wanted the, them to be genuinely frightened when they get killed. I had set myself up, you know, where I was going. I had myself blindfolded, and I had them lead me into the room and just kind of block it out without me even seeing what uh, Gunner looked like in the mask. The shot was simply I was going to come running into the room and screaming at him. I was going to raise the hammer. He screams in terror, and I hit him and kill him with the hammer. To make it look realistic, uh, there was a fellow actually on the floor behind him who had his hand in the back of his belt so that as I swung the hammer, because I, my hammer wasn't obviously wasn't going to hit him, as I swung the hammer, he was going to jerk uh, Alan to the floor. I worked myself up. I was getting really into it, blah, blah, blah. And they do the action camera rolling. I come roaring in. Alan turns. There's this beautiful look of horror in his face. I start screaming, giving it a blood-curdling scream. He rips loose of the, of the, the, the belt guy and dives out the door, ru ruining the shot. He was so frightened, he couldn't do the take. Sally, I hear something. Stop! Stop! When Leatherface comes out of the bushes, that's still the scariest moment in the movie for me. So when I saw him in his in his rig, uh, it was a total surprise. I can't help it. I'm that, I mean, you're you're in it, stupid. But no, it's still, oh, you know, it's still scary. Dottie Pearl was on the left side, right here. Uh, Toby was on the right. Uh, camera was shooting over my shoulder. Gunner, of course, coming in. We had uh, red Cairo syrup in our mouth. That was the fake blood. All three of us had a mouthful of it. And every time Gunner would, would come in and make a pass, uh, we'd all spit. And it gave me a chance to take another giant sip of the blood while they were pulling the chainsaw back. And every time they would hit, I would spew this blood again. We were squirting to get, you know, to, to, to see in the flashlight, you know, hopefully to see some spray go. 
and some you know you don't you don't see the wounds happening you see the after effect of it but yeah I yeah we were either spitting it or flinging it or something I don't know and we just kept doing it until we were all out of spit and it worked great because it looked like you know it was hitting of course a main artery there were a lot of people like getting hurt and like I don't know if it's so much the subject matter, or I, I guess so, but um, there was always seemed like there was that edge, you know, that if you weren't careful, you were gonna get hurt, and people did. I know Marilyn did. Those black eyes and everything were real. I had to remember where I was in the picture to see if I needed makeup to remove them. <laughs> Started out trying to beat her to give me this stick, or, you know, that broom handle, and uh, it was a real broom handle, it was wood. Poor Jim. We shot that all night long. And hour after hour, we were doing all this takes. And he was trying to pull the punches. And Toby would tell him, it looks like you're pulling the punches. And I had to hold back. And he, he, he can't, don't, don't hold back. It looks fake. We'd give you a rubber one to hit it with. That looks fake, too. Take after take, it's getting later and later. Finally, we did it so much that Marilyn was getting beaten up a little bit. She, she told me, she said, Jim, come on, let's get it over with. <laughs> About the eighth time, they, I finally was catching on to it. And I was really lacing it to her, and they said it was a take. You know, boy, old Marilyn, she <laughs> keeled over. One shot where I'm in the chair with the arms. They needed a gag, and they said, somebody get a rag or something. So somebody found something on the floor somewhere and got this gross, filthy rag that had been gosh knows where. And that looks good. Oh, put it in her mouth. This is a gritty, nasty, disgusting that we're going to have to use again and again. No one thought about getting a clean one. And um, there was one time where Ed Neal's groping at me and I'm like this. And so I'm in this chair and my feet and hands are tied and the camera's right there. And I'm going, getting away from Ed Neal, right? So I get so far away from Ed Neal, I go down. And there I am tied to the armchair with my feet tied. And the first thing the cameraman said is, <sighs> she went out of the shot. And then they just said, well, let's do such and such. And I'm sitting there on the floor with the gag in my mouth, still, you know, somebody. <laughs> get the girl. That, that, that made it. Maybe they were all trying to get me in character. As a production, it was a very abusive production, and you see things you don't want to do, like working 27-hour days just because you didn't have your shit together enough to shoot it all in one day, which you should have known you could if you'd have planned it. The most grueling night of the shoot was the dinner scene uh, that proved to be like a 27-hour shooting day. 26 hours. It was like a 27-hour shoot or something like that. Almost 36 hours straight we shot. I'm sure Toby's got it up past 40 by now. There were actually two reasons it had to be completed in one night. They were losing me that day. I was through and had to go. I just had a weak contract with them. And the other reason is we'd run out of appliances for old grandpa, who was uh, you know, 18 or 19 years old. And the poor guy, you know, it was, it was basically glued to his face, so he was scarred for life. <laughs> Okay, gang, we're gonna be here till we finish this scene. And we all kind of accepted it. Somebody decided to take this chicken, very clever, and make the head and have the feet. Some kind of beautiful decoration for the center of the table. What they didn't think about was after day after day and under the lights and in a house that's totally has big black curtains over the windows to make sure no light was coming in at any time, whether we were shooting day or night, though we just kept going. That chicken started to rot. We were shooting this in Texas in the summer. It was 95, 100, 105 degrees every day. And the dinner scene, though it takes place at night, uh, was shot during the day. So we covered up all the windows, or they covered up the windows, and then we had all this light in there. So that room was probably 120 degrees. I mean, I think that's a conservative estimate of the temperature in that dining room. Boy, was it hot, and the meat got rotten in a hurry, and they, and uh, we're all in there. And I never did get ill physically, where a lot of people did. They'd run outside, <laughs> come back in. There was a moment during the film, when during the dinner scene, when I went out and threw up. The stench on that set was kind of a combination of Gunner's uh, perspiration, because he was in that 
get up for so long that he was just drenched in sweat. I was the smelliest element of the set. Uh, I mean, it's an embarrassing to admit, but the problem was they had one costume for me. They had no money. They had one costume for me. They didn't dare have it cleaned because they were afraid it would be lost or the ch color would change. So I wore the same clothes 12 to 16 hours a day for a month. And we all really stank. <laughs> I just, that's one thing I remember a lot is, it, is the body odor. I think we all got pretty ripe. One lamp in the room was made out of a skeleton. The light bulb got close to the bones and started the damn skeleton on fire and smelling old bones is bad too. I was in the worst position on that 26 hour shoot. That was the big dinner scene because as the boom man, I was up highest and he rises as, and so do all the smells. What I remember of that shoot was just Marilyn screaming in my headphones for hour after hour after hour after hour. At that point, they had, there had been a number of unfortunate instances with dead dogs. As set pieces, they had uh, made an attempt to put dead animals around the room. A veterinarian that I knew uh, worked at the local animal shelter. He wanted these sitting around the house and dogs and cats and things like this. Well, I was going out finding stuffed animals all over the place, but we were not finding stuffed domestic dogs and cats. They had a lot of dead animals that carcasses that they would burn or, or I, I don't I know would go out to the pile, the pile of bones or whatever, pretty much every week. And so I was able to get some animals that had been killed. Now I got this wonderful idea to to embalm some. I was injecting all of them with some formaldehyde just to keep them from um, you know, stinking, <laughs> sinking us out of the place and turning into maggots. It was getting kind of grim, but then when Dottie uh, had, a, had a dog in her little lap and it was going to inject formaldehyde in the hind leg, oh, this is terrible stuff. So, uh, and she, she injected it and it went through the leg and into her leg and she shot herself with a, a little pop of formaldehyde. I just almost became hysterical that I was going to suddenly, you know, stiffen up, harden up, and I had embalmed myself. And then she said, this is not happening. And I said, no. They started stinking to high heaven, and then they tried cremating them. Poured gasoline all over it, you know, and ignited this. And, and, and I guess thinking that it would make it disappear. And um, it's a little more complicated than that. I mean, because there's like a, you know, a couple hundred pounds that had to just kind of disappear. They wouldn't light, and so there was like this smoking dead dog aroma coming into the house in addition to all the head cheese and the dead chicken parts. It was a horrific night. And uh, But it just went on and on and on. Tempers were getting frayed and all that, but uh, we got through it. We really did. It, uh, it's really good. a lot of fun when you think back on it. It was rough, but we got it. The window, this was what's so crazy. Toby said, Marilyn, we don't want you to jump through the sugar glass. And I said, why? No, I guess I was so close to finishing, I didn't want her to get hurt. So Mary makes a jump of about a foot on the ground. And then they get me, and they put the scaffolding thing up here where I'm six feet above the ground. And then Marilyn did drop, like, I don't know, eight or 10 feet and do the landing. I would have rather jumped out the window, but I guess this was more effective. I could have done without that scene. That one scared me, just simply because I didn't want to break my ankle, which it did hurt my ankle, which is why I limp at the end of the picture. Toby and Kim, who were babying this project from the very beginning, but Every day they would sit and discuss for hours what they were going to shoot in minor script revisions so that we would sit there and wait for them to make their decisions before we could ever begin shooting any day. And so ultimately the production kind of slipped further and further behind. The final day of shooting, I took off that white, those pants that just stood up to greet me every morning, threw them down, and I thought, I'm finished. That's the End. that's over. Never again will I have to come and put on this horrible clothes. I can get my hair back in condition. I get my skin back. I mean, I was going to have to rebuild everything. I was a mess. Poor Marilyn Burns at the end of the show, you know, where I just literally took buckets and poured over her. 
I think it actually stained her blonde hair after a while. There was so much blood. She had pink hair. And so I need a couple of more shots. I need the, shot, the hysterical shot of her as she's being taken away from Leatherface. And they called me that night, and they said, Marilyn, something happened. We didn't get it. I said, you didn't get what? It didn't, we didn't get it. We got to reshoot this. So when I was crazy at the end of the movie, laughing hysterically, that was not acting. That was me having to go back and do this one more time. To keep costs down, Hooper and Henkel convinced participants to defer salary until a distribution deal was struck, then awarded points. These points were not taken from the total gross, as some participants believe, but from Vortex's 50% ownership of the picture. My last scene to shoot was uh, my favorite, the first time you see Franklin, and it's the roll down the hill scene. And why I like it was because when we got to that point, uh, they owed me a couple of weeks' pay. I mean, just a couple of hundred, few hundred dollars. That wasn't much, but uh, I didn't believe the film would ever go out. And even if it did or didn't, I didn't care. I needed to be paid. And, and they were out of money. So they were, they were making everybody, or offering deals to defer payment and to do, they were scraping by, they were scraping the bottom of the barrel. Uh, so the day before, I said, you know, I got bills to pay, you got bills to pay, here's the deal. Either I get paid or you get some other fat boy to go down the hill. So I met with Ron Bozeman. He was the acting producer, assistant producer, whatever. And he cut me a check, which was great, paid in full. So when I go down the hill in that pocket, there's a check that says paid in full. Once we finished shooting, we were like snotty film students and we thought, that we knew everything and of course like most naughty film students that the director was an idiot and didn't know what he was doing uh and you know we sort of regret that that we took that attitude while we were shooting but we couldn't help ourselves and um we finished shooting and then the movie was in the editing room for a year or more cut the film in my living room and uh and uh right next to it was a little room a little bedroom where i had the musical instruments and the uh so I scored in one room and cut in the other. Our instrumentation was, a lot of it was toys. I'd been working with experimental music for uh, some time, and, 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 and then Wayne was into sound. Oftentimes it'd be like, let's just do a rumble. Let's just do seething. These calls came from Toby, Jimmy. Let's just do ice. I had this African instrument metal instrument hang it, hanging from it. It had things on it like uh, tambourines, those little things. And I would, I would saw that damn thing as hard as I, you know, put as much pressure sh uh, you know, on the string so you, you could hear the, uh, you know, the increments as the bow slipped across the, you know. <laughs> and as it did that, then these things would rattle too. And indeed, by using the unconventional, that, that opened up the possibilities. If you're, I mean, you're not doing a fugue, you're doing bones. So I had a library of, of all kinds of sound that I could then control by editing. The production ran out of funds during editing, and Henkel and Hooper had to sell yet more shares in Vortex. They'd come up with a budget of $60,000, and that's what he funded, and he said, if anything, you need any more money than that, you got to get it out, you know, you got to sell part of your interest. Toby and I had to sell off basically our portion, a good chunk of our portion of the film in order to raise more money. Chainsaw was screened for most of the major studios, but none were interested in distributing the picture. Showed it to AIP, uh, showed it to, showed it around, and um, then this group, this new group, uh, Bryanston Films, um, showed it to them and they said, you know, instantly, so, you know, we'll buy it on the spot. We got this letter that said, hey, we made a deal with Bryanston. Hubba, 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 we're gonna, you know, this is gonna come out. I said, oh, great. And uh, Steve came in the office that day and I said, look, we made a deal with Bryanston. And Steve said, they're mafia. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre opened in drive-ins and hardtop theaters across Texas in October 1974. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. After you stop screaming, you'll start talking about it. Friends of mine hired a limousine for me. It was, it was a premiere for me. Uh, it was at the Village Cinema. 
you know, and there it was. And it looked like a real film. And I wasn't expecting it to be a real film. You know, I thought it was going to be something that would maybe get shown somewhere to drive in somewhere, and that would be about it. I was kind of like in shock the first time I saw it because it was just this this unrelenting nightmare of a movie. I thought it was pretty bad. I liked the movie a lot. Um, I remember being stunned by the sense of humor. I remember being really impressed with the rawness of the film. When, we, when, when it was put together, the, the kind of sense of butchery of human beings and the, uh, and the terror of it was, to me, like a groundbreaking horror film. I saw a poster in front of the cinema who will survive and what will be left to them. I could not miss this movie. It, it was just the, the greatest poster I've ever seen. I never believed in my wildest imagination that this movie would actually deliver the groceries. God awful hell, holy hell. This is a Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I, you know. To me, that was as profound as a cinematic experience as seeing uh, Eight and a half and Citizen Kane and Dawn of the Dead. The whole cinema bonded into one mass hysterical group watching this movie that was just totally outrageous. Rex Reed says the scariest movie you'd ever seen, such as that, and then and then it really took off. Yeah, it got really good reviews and people loved it and it kind of surprised all of us who worked on it because we weren't really prepared for any sort of a claim to accrue to that movie. This movie is, is happening. You know, it's number three. You know, it's it's coming up. It had a bullet on it. You know, it's it's shooting to the top. It's playing here. It's playing there. All of a sudden, you're you're a part of something, and you start uh, reading uh, the news publications that said, okay, it took in millions here and millions there, and and it it broke records everywhere. Most of us had different percentages, so I thought. It's going to be at least a payday. But according to Bryanston's reports, the Texans' 35% share of profits amounted to $5,734. So you start uh, looking up your little percentages of a percentage of, of a production company that has X percentage of the production companies. My temptation is to call it a, a deception, but maybe it was a misunderstanding. But essentially, what no one ever found out, why I certainly never knew, was that Vortex didn't own the film. So what we were paid in our percentages were a fraction of what we thought we were supposed to get. Vortex turned out to be one of, I think, three companies who had the financial interest in the film. So when I'm being given points, I think I'm being given points in a film, but I'm actually being given points in a company that owns points in the film. And we had this percentage, half a point or a point, whatever it was, you know, of the net, which now I realize is it's like <laughs> you're not going to get anything, so don't expect it, basically. But we didn't know that at the time. But still, even making all those calculations, you think, okay, well, there's, there's some dollars that should be rolling in here. Nine months after the film was released, when we were expecting to see a lot of money because the movie was doing so well, my first royalty check was for $47.07. It was a very unpleasant experience for most of the people involved. There was a film made for $125,000 that should have been about half of that. And it was a film that made, we don't know how much, but at least $100 million. And we saw pittance out of it because for one reason or another, we got ripped off. I had never intended to get rich from this movie. Uh, I was frankly, I was stunned that anything ever came at all. You know, I was on my own. I didn't have a lot of financial commitments, so I wasn't in debt. But I know some of the other guys really struggled because they, ex they had bills, they had families, and they knew the movie was making a lot of money, and they had counted on that money. I may can, you know, have a chance to get a few shekels, you know, out of this movie, and have life a little bit easier for myself, my, you know, my son, not to be. See, that's where the massacre is, is after the movie. My feeling was it had launched my career, and that was enough for me. I was the only person involved in the production of the picture that took action against the producers of the picture for, you know, the way we were treated. Kim Hinkle and Bill Parsley and Warren Skarn and I went to New York. And uh, then Warren and I went down to Bryanson's office to talk to, um, to Lou. Um, 
I've called him Lou Piranha so long that I can't really ever remember his, his real uh, name. Basically, they made a deal with known mafia company and they couldn't figure out why they got ripped off and said, <laughs> think about it. Made a deal with a guy named Butchie Piranha, what do you think? <laughs> and we walked into his office and he was seated there with a couple of big henchmen on either side of him, just like it was, just like in the movies. I told him we'd come to audit the books and we wanted to see him and he said, well, they weren't available. And, and I said, well, you're either going to have to let me see those books or, you know, I'm going to have to see you. And, and he just looked me straight in the eye and said, you don't have enough balls to sue me. And uh, well, he's half right. I came back here and sued him. Cause <laughs> but by the time the Texans sued Bryanston in May 1976, the company was apparently broke. Instead of forcing Bryanston into bankruptcy, the Texans settled for an out-of-court payment in February 1977 of $400,000 for their share of profits and to relinquish control of the movie. I don't guess anybody will ever know exactly how much that they stole. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, despite its lack of on-screen bloodshed, would attract an R rating in the States. However, elsewhere in the world, the censors were not quite so lenient. In 1975, the British Board of Film Censors refused to grant Chainsaw a theatrical certificate, with BBFC Secretary James Furman commenting that the film seemed like the pornography of terror. Furman said at the screening of Texas Chainsaw Massacre that this film is fine for middle-class intellectuals at the National Film Theatre, but imagine its effect on the average car worker in Birmingham. James Furman actually went through the film to see what could or, or should be cut and discovered that there was no one individual scene or image that was unacceptable, that it was the massive kind of cumulative frenzy of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre which wasn't acceptable and therefore the whole thing had to be cut. And the film remained on the BBFC blacklist for 23 years. It is subjective and the sooner that's admitted by all and sundry, uh, the better, I would say. With a long history of inconsistent decision-making, it is perhaps not surprising that as soon as James Furman retired from his position at the BBFC in 1998, the new guardians of moral decency in Britain, Robin Duvall and Andreas Whittam Smith, finally decided that Chainsaw was no longer a threat to decent society, and the film was subsequently granted an 18 certificate in an uncut form. In the 25 plus years since the Texas Chainsaw Massacre first assaulted the senses of a mass audience, its popularity has continued to grow. And now a generation of horror fans who were not even born when the film was made consider Leatherface as one of horror cinema's great villains. What's your favorite scene from Chainsaw, fellas? Leatherface. Pardon me? Leatherface. So I figured it was the cameraman's job and Toby's job to avoid me. So I was actually swinging the saw. And I thought it was like my one moment in this movie where I'm going to try to kill Toby. <laughs> what are you doing? It's a not camera. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre has had an unquestionable effect on the horror genre. It is arguable that the elusive killer Leatherface has inspired a whole multitude of masked slashers throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And it is claimed that the origin of the triumphant surviving female, now a staple of the genre, originated with Chainsaw Sally. What I wanted to do was to come out of my mental institution and and go after the family. That was my, I thought that would make a good movie. Being the product of a genre synonymous with exploitation, coupled with the fact that Leatherface survives the length of the original film, it was only a matter of time before the sexually ambiguous, chainsaw-wielding maniac would make a return to the big screen. I, I brooded for years that no one appreciated or saw the humor or the comedy. <laughs> and Chainsaw 1, and that's true. It took like eight years. It was so damn shocking. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2 was a big-budget Hollywood production starring Dennis Hopper, 
arriving almost 10 years after the original. The emphasis was on black comedy, but this didn't stop Hooper from pulling out all the stops as far as Gore was concerned. And we want you to be in it. Can you be in it? And he said, we're going to start it next to whenever it was. I said, yeah, fine, heavens, yeah. And they, why they only got me back, I don't know. They asked me to be in the, if I was interested in being in the film, and I was. Uh, the problem was what they were offering me for pay. They offered me scale, union scale plus 10 percent. And I asked them why there was this 10 percent added, and they said, well, it was, f it was for your agent. So I said I wouldn't accept it, that I thought that uh, that was much too little, and that I wanted them to think about what they thought I was worth to the film, and then come back with some offer that reflected that value. And a week or two later, they came back with scale. They dropped the 10%. I mean, they didn't raise the price at all. And I asked why, and the woman said, well, you don't have an agent, so you don't need the 10%. Well, I wanted to hire Ed, you know, for the hitchhiker role. And uh, I simply couldn't make a deal with the agent. I had been sent a couple of years before that this uh, little homemade film called The Texas Chainsaw Manicure. Manicure! <laughs> He loved the manicure. Uh, he wanted to know who played the hitchhiker. I said, well, that was me. And he said, well, you know, if I ever do Chainsaw 2, I'll keep you in mind. I got the best manicure ever. Hey, that's great, honey. We should celebrate with, with some head cheese. I had a little free-floating anxiety. And all of a sudden, you know, here comes Jim Cedo. Without even thinking what to say, it just kind of came out of me. I went, it's the cook. And he went, hey, how you doing? You know, and, uh, and uh, just meeting him was just so great. It just, it totally grounded me and it, and it just made it, you know, it, it turned whatever that anxiety was into an excitement that this was gonna be a lot of fun. You have bet! Difference of day and night, that was, second of all, that was nothing but money. The finest places to, <coughs> to stay, the finest of everything, the, you know, limousines at your disposal. It's a, 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 a crazy, loony film. It's a hysterical movie. Lick my plate, you know, Nick. The film that was written and shot was truly a wonderful satire. It was a wonderful film. And I hope that one day Toby can put out his own cut of that movie. I doubt it because all that God only knows where the material is. The biggest thing that I recall is Canon Films just, they were really horrible. They were horrible. They treated tr Toby horribly. And they were constantly uh, second guessing him, looking over his shoulder, pulling money, giving money. They were just really arbitrary about all of their decisions. We had some kind of, uh, you know, legacy. <laughs> and we were, you know, bound and determined to try to make it as good as number one. I think Bill Johnson had a real burden because, first of all, the, the Leatherface they wanted him to create clearly was not the same Leatherface in, in personality as the original film. The mask that Tom Savini had ran in the paper the other day, it looks like an art director. You can see Tom Savini at work rather than Leatherface made this. Two different movies, but still two pretty good movies, I thought. This was going to be a magic, wonderful revisitation. The first film, but better. The first film, the why behind the first film. A bit of the why behind the first film. And um, Canon Films didn't want the why. They just wanted the f first film over and over again. Well, it was not finished, for one thing. There were, there were, there were incomplete uh, sequences. And they got a hold of it and cut it themselves and just fucked it up. Canon at that time was sort of running their business out of a couple of different countries. Um, sort of, they were based in Israel some of the time and sometimes in L.A. So we opened at number one, as I recall. It took a pretty steep dive after that, unfortunately. Um, but as far as re residual payments and, and ancillary markets and things like that, the, the, the film's never really supposedly shown a profit. And it's got too much of a cult following, I think, for that to be possible. Nobody was willing to invest the money to go you know, to audit their books. Look at the meat on that one! <laughs> what happened to the money? Where's our money? Where, where, what happened? Because the first one, uh, the big rumor in Austin always was that uh, there was some, uh, there were some shady financiers behind the, behind the film, and that's where all of it went. 
um, I suppose Canon Films now are the shady financiers behind number two. In fact, I think uh, all things considered, it came out, um, you know, it came out well, regardless of what, if it was what I set out to do or not. Leatherface would return again in a far less lavish New Line production. In Leatherface, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Part 3. But I basically was like uh, probably literally the 50th choice to do this movie. Um, I, I really think they literally went down a list because I've met so many directors in, in the subsequent years that say, oh yeah, you did that Leatherface movie. Yeah, I was offered the habit. Man, I just couldn't do it. So I think it was just literally I got it by, you know, total default. Because um, I know uh, McNaughton turned it down, Peter Jackson, you know, all the, and they literally went through a list. The new line said, legally cannot speak to Toby Hooper or Kim Hankel. Given my druthers, I would have wanted to rewrite the script. Because, I mean, Dave's, Dave Scow is a talented writer, but I just felt that there were a lot of unanswered questions, a lot of needless uh, questions that, that the audience would come to, to ask. Because, like, who is this family? Where do they come from? It, oh, gee, it's a pretty damn big coincidence that they happen to have a desiccated grandfather that they keep alive, too, or don't keep alive, or whatever. My concept was, hey, let's, you know, at least return to the more nasty roots and, and uh, dark dark humor versus an overall jokey tone. First thing when I got the child, I go, man, this would really make it the true sequel by you have the original Leatherface back. He talked to me about being in the film, and, and uh, we looked at the script and talked about what a mess the script was. One of the main things was he needed uh, a certain monetary uh, commitment from New Line and that they weren't prepared to give. And it wasn't an outrageous thing he wanted. You know, it just, it was fine. I mean, it was very unlike the kind of, the kind of indirect way that I dealt with Canon. I mean, he said, I'll talk to the producers. He came back to me and said, we can't pay you more than scale. So I guess we can't have you. And I said, fine. I mean, it was very direct and, you know, honorable, and I had no problem with that. I mean, I was disappointed, but it just didn't work out. What happened was we had a test screening in Burbank, so we screen the movie, and it gets a, it gets a better. I mean, for what? Hey, look, it, it is what it is, and but it got a better response than like Nightmare on Elm Street Five, the movie they just did, had done previously. So we have this big powwow at the end of the uh, evening, and they're just livid. Uh, Bob Shea and uh, this guy, this guy Rolf Mitwig, the head of Foreign, he go. He, Rolf says, oh, "Do you realize it'll be banned in every country? I can't sell this movie Foreign." It's, it's, it's you know, way too bloody, it's this, it's that, it's, it's, it's way too offensive. It's Bob Shea at the, uh, the next day comes in the editing room and goes, that's gone, that's gone, that's gone. So, so all this stuff got truncated. This is way before we even started submitting it to the, to the, to the ratings board. When, when it, we ran into all these ratings problems, we re had to resubmit it to the ratings board many, many times to get an R. Um, the film constantly, we were cutting the negative because they were, uh, they wanted to, you know, to, to play in theaters uh, right away and, and at that time they th thought they could still make the October release date. So, so the negative kept getting cut and they never did a protection negative of those effects seen. And it was a nasty movie, it was, very, it was a very nasty movie. Well, I don't want it to sound like it's a lost classic or lost masterpiece or anything, no, it's not. The theatrical version of the movie made me look incompetent as a director. Because there were scenes where, I, oh, man, I directed this movie, I had no fucking idea what's going on. I mean, because you can't, it, it was literally incoherent the way, the, way, the way they had to cut it to cut around this stuff. And I wanted my name taken off the movie. And that's the last, the last words I said to Mike DeLuca. And this, this is, if, if you don't know, Mike DeLuca is now one of the most powerful guys in Hollywood. I, the last thing I said, I, I want my name off the movie. What do you mean you want your name? I want my name off the fucking movie. I want my name off the fucking movie. And then he hangs up. And that's a last time. And they couldn't take my name off the movie because they'd already printed up uh, Real One, uh, which obviously had the credits, because Real One was the only reel that didn't have any changes. Writer of the original, Kim Hankel, directed the fourth installment in the series as the return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We felt like we could uh, kind of revive uh, the, the film to, to bring it back to the spirit of the original. And uh, I didn't really want to get involved as much as I wound up being involved, but finally let Bob Coon bully me into it. So I want you to get almost in the same plane as her face, your forward, you know, looking down here. Almost in the same plane of her face. What would you do this for? What's your minimum? So I told her, and it wasn't a lot. I mean, basically I said, uh, I don't know if you want the number, but I said, I think, as I recall, $3,500 a week, which is less than two days of what I would normally charge, plus the rights to do the documentary about the making of the film with releases signed by all actors and crew on the first day on the set. 
And she came back and said, no, uh, that's uh, too much. And the offer stands at 600 a week. <sighs> if you start to feel your mask come loose or anything, let me know, OK? Well, I, it was happening during the scene. You know, what was okay. I going to do? Hey, my mask is so, loose. Yeah. No. The thing that, that you dream about happening happened, and then you realize it's sort of your worst nightmare, because we ended up with two stars that we didn't think would be stars. Matthew McConaughey and Renee Zellweger. Here's still Renee. I mean, that's Vilmer's whole gig is that he despises the the straight kill. And I think you know he got a big kick out of it. You know, it was it was a very difficult shoot, uh, particularly for Renee. She got beat up pretty badly, and she was a real trooper. They had decided not to release Chainsaw until after Jerry Maguire, and they thought it would help. Jane saw when it was released because Renee would be, you know, well known. <laughs> this is the woman who's going to make sure I get a job in August. <laughs> Welcome to my home. They said they couldn't do the theatrical release because the CAA said that they did not want Matthew McConaughey uh, exploited in that film and uh, that they didn't believe in exploiting. Uh, a known actor just to try to get a film released, and I said, well, I thought that's what you guys did for a living up there. You're a bona fide moron. Come poking your nose around here where it don't belong. We finally ended up suing Columbia TriStar, which was probably a mistake, because um, they did a token theatrical release. They released it in 10 theaters across the United States. It is the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre, however, which still holds the reputation as a startlingly original work in the history of American cinema. A print of the film resides in New York's Museum of Modern Art, and, of course, it is still held in high regard by fans of extreme cinema all over the world. Just remember, my family's always been with me. Incidentally, the house where the Chainsaw family resided in the original Chainsaw has now been converted into the Kingsland Old Town Grill. When you're next in Texas, you may want to pop in for a bite to eat. It was a really a shock to see it because it's such a beautiful building and I don't remember it you know, looking nice like this at all. And if you look up this way, this is the window that Marilyn ran out of. Yeah, this is the home where I carried Terry McMinn down. I, we brought Terry down this way. This was the original dining room. This is where um, the, the lamp here was. We had, we had Marilyn tied here to the armchair. And then over here was the room with all the feathers and the bone furniture. This was the living room in the film. Well, I thought we were making a good movie. I always believed in that. I think what I was trying to say is, you know, now, this is America. <laughs> <You know? laughs> This is the first time I ever worked with a bunch of college kids like that. It's mostly always been with, with the pros, you know, because, uh, and it was fun. You know, and for me it was wonderful, because on my, after that I would have to go back to my real work, which is I um, oversaw or supervised the camp for mentally retarded children and, and kids with emotional disturbances. And that's pretty intense. Well, people say, well, this, this is the way movies are made. Well, it's not, you know. If you look at all of us who worked on the film, we probably got paid less for the time we spent than if we'd gotten a job at McDonald's. I've had a lot worse jobs. <laughs> you know, there's a lot harder ways to really make your living. So if I had my choice, I would go back and sit in that van again in a second and do it all over again.
Dog will hunt. Get that bitch, Leatherface. Get that bitch. Dog will hunt.